Our author tonight, Justice O'Connor, is well known to you as a distinguished member of the U.S. Supreme Court for 25 years. I just taught one of her opinions in my civil rights class this morning and justly praised it as beautifully written. <laughs> Justice O'Connor, as you know, was the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, and that was just one of several times in which she confronted and broke down barriers to women in the law. I like to note that Justice O'Connor has served in all three branches of government, and that her so-called retirement would keep two or three of us busy. She's incredibly active, and some of the things she does are lead some very important projects, only two of which relate to the independence of the judiciary, and my personal favorite, to civic education for youth including an amazing interactive website at www.icivics.org. And we have the perfect interviewer for our author tonight, the Honorable Ruth McGregor, retired Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court, who graduated from this law school, first in her class. She took leave from private practice to serve as Justice O'Connor's first law clerk at the U.S. Supreme Court. More recently, Justice McGregor has been working with Justice O'Connor on the O'Connor Judicial Selection Initiative of the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System. And that project seeks to advance and enhance merit selection of judges, and thus to strengthen the independence of the judiciary. So as I invite Justice McGregor to begin the interview, please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. State University. I add my welcome and thank you for coming to talk with us at your law school. <laughs> you have written other books, Justice O'Connor, about your life on the Lazy Bee, to inform about the majesty of the law, with your granddaughter about my mother, or my grandmother as a judge, and two children's stories. Why did you decide to write Out of Order? Because I hadn't covered everything that <laughs> makes a good story. The, work and the experiences of different members of the Supreme Court are all pretty interesting, at least to me, and I thought much of it to the general public as well. And I tried to pick up many of the threads of interest to the public generally in out of order. Stories about the court and former members of the court and things that I hope all of you will enjoy if you decide to read it. I thought it was interesting to research and write. Um, before I turn to the book content, I, I'd just like to ask you something else. You follow a schedule of travel and speaking and court work nationally, internationally. It's a schedule that simply exhausts most of us. How do you find time to write a book? <laughs> well, that's a good question, but I tried to take time to um, work chapter by chapter on some of the things that I thought might be of interest. And I figured that if I could do um, several chapters over a three month interval, <coughs> that I could see my way clear to finishing it within a year. And I did. That's work. amazing. Um, you, you divide the book, of course, into chapters with different topics. There's so much about the Supreme Court that people are interested in learning and that you've learned over the years. How did you decide which areas to, to talk about? Well, just like you would. What is the most appealing to you? Uh, what was the most appealing to me? And what were the things that I really enjoyed learning about that I didn't really know? And how could I develop some of the stories about some of the individual justices who've served in the past that today we know very little, if anything, about. It's been a long story. You know, we're talking a couple hundred years here, right? And some of the people were pretty fascinating. So there's still plenty left to tell. I haven't told it all. You all can get busy now. Write <laughs> <laughs> another chapter. Yeah. Um, you describe how in the early years, the Supreme Court had very little work to do and wasn't exactly regarded as an institution to which able men aspire. Uh, are there particular factors you point to that, that changed and enhanced the reputation of the court? 
it came very slowly. I mean, at first, um, people didn't know much about it and didn't tend to think it would amount to much. And the court itself did not have a very interesting calendar. And in those days, we didn't have instant communication. You couldn't go on the internet and see what cases were pending. I mean, it was so different. You just didn't know what was happening. So we live in such a different era today where any citizen can find out what are the cases that the Supreme Court has accepted to hear. You can even look it up and see the petition that was filed, see the answer that was filed. It's amazing. You can find written description. You can find law review articles about them. It's so different. And in the early days, people didn't know much about what the court was doing. I don't think the court members themselves knew that much about it. <laughs> the so it's changed, thankfully. And I was interested to read that even recording the court's opinions, once they started issuing written opinions, was done in a very haphazard manner. Oh, it was. The early days at the court, uh, the opinions of the court even are missing in large measure. We don't really know what those early court opinions were. We have a few of them, but I don't think the ones we have are necessarily accurate. It's amazing how little was kept in the early days and how little we knew. And was it for a time the clerk of the court was someone who just announced he was going to be the clerk of the court and so he made good or bad yes, he publications? Was, he wasn't paid. There was no salary for the clerk. And the clerk just sort of volunteered and said, well, I'll keep track of it for a while. And the clerk would, in some cases, reproduced most of the work, but in other cases, he didn't. And so it was amazing. We, we really don't have accurate records of what the court did in the early days, even their opinions. One of the interesting things I thought that you wrote about involved the requirements for the Supreme Court in place from 1789 to 1891, for more than 100 years that the justices had to ride circuit. Oh, would you explain what that was? <laughs> for, for many years after the court began, every justice would be assigned part of the United States as their so-called circuit, the territory that that justice would serve. And the justice was expected to visit the different courthouses in that circuit. And there weren't very many, of course, but was expected to go to them and hear whatever business came before the court in those outlying areas. And there was no good transportation. There weren't good motels or hotels. I mean, it was just amazing what the early justices went through. And they had to sort of stop and I don't know how you describe it, just local flop houses. And they had to share beds with strangers and eat in these terrible places. Yeah, some kind of food, it's a wonder they survived. It really is. What well, you read about during those times when people would go to a flop house or whatever, and there, there might be three or four men sharing a, a bed. Yes. And I gather the justices right. did the same. They did the same. They piled right in. <laughs> Well, and then they would be a trial court. They'd be a trial judge, yes. right? Yes. And then their cases potentially could be heard by the could Supreme be, Court. Um, appeal yeah. all the way up to their own Supreme Court. It was a very strange setup. It took us a long time to get our court system straightened out. One, there were a number of reasons you point to that, that the legislature, especially Congress, thought it was a good idea to keep judges right in the circuit. Yes, members of Congress thought it was better to keep the justices better in tune with the people down at the grassroots level, so we say, and that that was better if they heard the problems of people um, in their home turf and didn't have any advantages and were, were not privileged in any way by any reduction in the caseload. And it was an, an amazing set of circumstances. And most of the justices really disliked the setup. They didn't want to be out on the road month in and month out. And there, 
they didn't know how they were going to be able to travel or when or where they could stay. I mean, just imagine, we, we had a very different country in those days than we do today, to say the least. And you also mentioned how once the work started becoming more frequent for the Supreme Court, that work kind of was piling up while the justices were out riding circuit. Yes, the work piled up in Washington, D.C., and eventually they had to come back and hear some of the work that had um, arisen and been accepted at the Supreme Court level. Um, you, you tell us about how the, the Congress thought that using, having the justices ride circuit would promote some pretty laudable goals. It would bring the court to the people, it would bring quality and uniformity to the lower courts, where of course nobody was required to be a lawyer to be a federal judge, and it would allow the justices to sort of serve as ambassadors of this new federal government. Those sound like pretty good goals. Um, does the court's current structure allow the, go the court to fulfill those kinds of goals? Oh, I don't think so. Um, it, but it was amazing how the court, as we know it today, could have endured what it went through in those early years. It's remarkable that it survived and that the nation got along a little bit with that set of state of affairs. But it did struggle and continue. And we ended up with the system we have today. Now, all the cases that the court accepts are heard at the court in Washington, D.C. Now, many have suggested that it would be great if the court could move around a little bit. Some of the state Supreme Courts, including the one you served with here, sit in places other than the state capitol and conduct hearings and um, citizens can come and hear them. Why don't you share with us how it worked out in Arizona? Well, I think it worked out very well. Those of you who are or have been students know that the Arizona Supreme Court sits at the law schools once every year. It's a regular calendar. It's not made up. It's what the court would hear anyway. And then usually twice during the year they go to one of the rural counties and sit there. And it really does further the goal of trying to get the court closer and having people have, have some feeling that this really is their court. I know it would be difficult for the U.S. Supreme Court to do that, but I think it's a great idea. It you is, and I, I will be curious <laughs> to, to see whether over time people propose that the Supreme Court itself holds some of its hearings in other parts of the United States. Certainly the court could do that if all the justices didn't object too much in traveling to that other city or place for conducting the hearings. But it certainly would be a possible thing to happen. And don't you think that if people can actually listen to the work of the court and see it at work, that that really um, engenders some confidence in the court? Yes, I think the people. How many of you, let's see a show of hands, how many of you have sat in the courtroom of the U.S. Supreme Court and heard a case. See, a fair sprinkling of hands have gone up. And I think it's very meaningful for the people who do succeed in being there and having a chance to hear a case argued at the court. I think it helps make much clearer to you how the court functions and to see how it works, see who asks questions, and how the questions are answered, it's quite interesting. So it wouldn't be a bad idea, perhaps, if occasionally our court heard cases in other locations. I don't think that's a proposal at present. I don't think so. Um, you do have a section in the book on oral advocacy before the court. And you talk about how, of course, arguments used to go on for days at a time. Oh, they did. I mean, in the early days of the court, when a case was heard in Washington, D.C., an important case, the lawyers in the case might end up arguing it for several days, not just a, now they're limited to an hour. And in the early days, they might be given several days to argue their case. Um, I think that problem is unnecessary, but what a change <laughs> we've seen, it really is amazing. Well, and when they argued, the court in the early days didn't ask many questions, did it? 
Not so many today. Uh, the justices are inclined to ask quite a few questions during the oral argument. They really do. You mentioned that during your 25 years on the court, one of the very best oral advocates you saw was our current Chief Justice, John Roberts. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of lawyers and law students listening to you tonight. If, if it was their goal to be a really effective oral advocate before the Supreme Court, what should they learn to do? Recorded um, records, recordings were made of many of the arguments that John Roberts made at the court and the other lawyers in, in the cases he was arguing. And it's possible for students, no doubt with the help of their professors, to get copies, uh, audio copies, of those arguments. And I think it's really useful for the students to get them and hear them. I, I recommend it. And if the law school here hasn't done that, I really think it would be very helpful if you did. And if I need to help you somehow get in touch with people to make that happen, I'd be happy to. Because I think it's very, very interesting to listen to arguments made by John Roberts and others who are skilled and just get, get an idea of what a really good oral argument sounds like. And what was it about the Chief Justice's arguments, as a lawyer, of course, that made them stand out for you? The articulate nature of it, his voice, his method of delivery, that was not irritating in any way. It was very <laughs> so, you know how some people are when they talk. His <laughs> was not. And he seemed to cover the subjects in a very, uh, thorough manner and a manner in which you left feeling that you had heard everything and you had understood it. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. And if students listen to those arguments, they also might want to read the briefs in advance so they know what the issues yes, were. Right, right, right. That helps. And of course, at the oral arguments at the Supreme Court, at least the parties to the case have read all of the written briefs, and they aren't brief at all. They're long presentations of what they intend to argue orally. But that helps, too. Sure. Um, you, you also tell us about the role of seniority at the Supreme Court. And it's developed, I guess, as part of the culture of the court that seniority does play a role. Would you tell us about how seniority is used at the court? Well, your seat in the courtroom as a justice is governed by how long you've been a member of the court. And the more senior you are, the closer you are seated to the Chief Justice. And I went back and forth, I mean, from one side of the bench to the other over the 25 years until I was seated next to the Chief Justice for some time. And so you can tell how long the justice has been on the court by where they're seated. Um, on the bench at the court. And does the seniority also play a role in the assignment of cases of opinions to write? To some extent, that is not as clear. The Chief Justice, if the Chief Justice is in the majority on a case, I mean, after the case has been briefed and orally argued, all nine of them get together in a room, just the nine of them together, no staff, and they go around the table and talk about the case. And the discussion starts with the Chief Justice saying how he thinks he would decide the case and why. And then it goes to the most senior justice on down to the most junior justice. And each can speak as long as they want and tell how they analyze the case and how, what they would do with it. Would they affirm or reverse and on what grounds? And that's such an interesting discussion. No staff is present at all. No recording is made of the discussion. If you want to remember it, you can take your own notes. But other than that, there's no record made of it. And that's the discussion. But you know, at the end, how, at least at that point in time, the different justices are going to vote. You know whether the judgment you're reviewing is going to be affirmed or reversed you know what the numbers are likely to be. Now, a justice can later change the justice's mind and do something different, but it, 
that doesn't happen very often. And you usually leave the room with a pretty clear idea of what's going to happen. Then the Chief Justice will assign someone on the court to write an opinion for the court. And he will assign someone to write who has expressed a view consistent with what the majority discussion uh, says is going to be the holding of the court. And if there is to be a dissent, then the most senior justice on the dissenting side will decide who should write the dissent. And anyone can write separately on any case. If you're not asked to write and you feel strongly, I want to say what I want to say, you can write. It's OK. But the, the assigned opinions will be the ones that you typically will see. The multiple opinions that we see from the court is something that's developed over history, isn't it? Weren't the early opinions mostly unanimous? Well, I think uh, in the early days, John Jay wrote a bunch of them. Yeah. And then John Marshall. And John Marshall just would say, he'd volunteer, he'd say, well, I'll try to write something on this, and they'd all say fine, and he would, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> and does, doesn't seniority also play a role with some things like within the conference room and who's responsible for doing? Well, like it's, it's, or, it's not a formal okay. thing, but usually the junior justice, the one who's been there the shortest time, if there's a knock on the door, the junior justice will go answer it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, it kind of governs if there's an empty chambers, who gets first crack at moving in. <laughs> the more senior you are, uh, you will have a better chance of moving if that's what you want to do. But was there some consternation about having you answer the door when you were playing? No, the door? nobody mentioned a word. Oh, I thought that they didn't. Didn't somebody wonder whether you would be insulted if you were made to answer the door as the only If woman? so, they didn't discuss it. They didn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite chapter, I think maybe in the book, was the one where you painted word portraits of four larger than life justices. And you chose a big variety. You chose Justice Samuel Fields, and you had Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., and Justice William O. Douglas, and then also Judge Justice James McReynolds. Ooh, he was the one that people disliked, really. He didn't have many friends on the court of any. He was a very disagreeable man. And it just, when I read about him, I'm so grateful that I didn't serve on the court when he was there. Yes. It sounded from what you wrote that he didn't like anybody. He no. was racially discriminatory, anti-Semitic, thought women should stay in their proper place, and didn't right. look much like him. Oh, he was miserable. Yeah. <laughs> Get the book and read that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you said that some people describe him as the worst justice ever to serve, and I, I gather maybe you agreed with that. I don't think maybe I do. I mean, I don't know. I didn't like what I read about him. And then there was Justice Fields, who sounded to me like a wild man of the West. He might have been. But he, was, he ran for president while he was on the Supreme Court. Yes, that's kind of unusual, but it's happened. <laughs> and and he was shocked if it happened. And he was arrested for murder while he was on the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't too big. No, he was <laughs> shot somebody, but he wasn't convicted. No, so he was quite, a, quite a, an independent sort of a guy. <laughs> well, you can see why he was one of the most colorful characters. And then, of course, you selected Justice Douglas, who was a Westerner. Yes, he certainly was. He came from Washington State, and he was big on hiking and those things all around the world. And he took lots and lots of trips. And he was, he was the one who... Um, made it popular to follow the old canal paths in and around Washington, D.C. He was quite known for his hiking and biking and so forth. You also mentioned that his, his personal life was perhaps more difficult than his professional life. Well, he life. had a number of lives. I don't remember now how many it was all told, but he had quite an active marital career. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I think you're right, they kept getting younger. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, you can't read the book. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. We're just giving you a little bit of pieces from here on what is it. And then, of course, you write about Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who yes. in many regard is one of the greatest legal minds ever. Well, he was an amazing man and a beautiful writer, and he was interested in everything and just truly an intellectual giant. And it was fun to read more about him. Now, before you wrote the book, had you known all of this about these old well, not justices? Not I mean, you, you know a little bit as you go along, but unless you decide you're going to look into some of these lives and people, you don't know enough to really talk about them. And I thought it was really a great excuse for me to go back and find out more about them. I loved it. I, I haven't finished yet. I should go back and do some more, but <laughs> I, it's not going to be another book. Don't worry. <laughs> what it might be? Well, I was thinking as I read this about these larger than life justices yes. that in your research you probably found quite a few who were pretty good characters. Was there something in particular about these four that struck you? Well, they were just. Um, Particularly interesting. Now, remind me who the four were again. Well, Mr. Samuel about. Fields was the oldest one. He was the wild man of the West. Yes, I and, him. you know, he had such an amazing career and life in the West. I mean, he was just interesting from that perspective. I'm a Westerner, as some of you are too, who are sitting in this room. And so you know you're kind of partial to the West. Okay, now, who else? And, well, both he and Justice Holmes served for a long Holmes. time on the court. Holmes was so amazing. He served a very long time. He was a brilliant man and a great contributor to the court. And he could have done anything. He could have been our president. Yeah. It might have been. Yeah, and, and done a good job. And of course, Justice McReynolds, you say, you didn't oh. choose all of them because they were great jurists. They were just big personalities. It was frightening. And you do have to read that chapter. He was very discouraging. Really kind of amazing. Um, I don't think somebody like that could be appointed today, at least no. I hope not. No, I think not. Yeah. If we held a confirmation hearing, someone I think like that would have a hard time. I think so. <laughs> well, and then you talk about the retirement of, of justices from the court. And of course, Justice Holmes was nearly 91 when... And his colleagues began to say, Oliver, it's time. <laughs> and he finally decided it was time and stepped down, but in his 90s, and he was really kind of over the hill. Yeah. And <laughs> then you, talk, you, you write about how there, there were changes made in the pension system and a lot of senior status that kind of encouraged justices to leave the court who otherwise might not have. Yeah, yes. eventually, um, federal judges, including justices of the Supreme Court, were given the right to retire and receive some kind of a pension after they retired after so many years' service, even though they were no longer still sitting. And that made a difference for many of them and let them retire. Uh, before that, they couldn't. If they retired, that was the end of the pay, and that was that. Yeah. So that was a good change to set up at a, after a certain number of years on the bench, a, a privilege of retiring with some kind of retirement pay. Yeah. And since your retirement, you have an office at the court and a, I do. St some staff reduced, but... I am still sitting as a volunteer with some of the federal courts of appeal around the country. Because it's kind of interesting to sit on cases. They're the funnel for the cases that come to the U.S. Supreme Court. And so they get some very interesting cases, the kind that I was used to hearing at the Supreme Court. And so two or three times a year, I will sit for several days with one of those federal courts of appeal. And I enjoy that. I also, in doing so, get to sit with some of the people there as judges whose opinions I used to review when I was a member of the Supreme Court. So it's kind of fun. And do they, do they actually make you write some of their opinions? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And then I have the privilege of having my opinions reviewed by the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> 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 Everybody in here who has been a judge
judge on a court that's reviewed by someone else will understand why that can be difficult at times. I know on the, on the Arizona Supreme Court, we always took some, some special pleasure when we decided a case on the basis of state constitutional law, because that could not be reviewed, even by the United States Supreme Court. We also had, I don't know, I, I think this was while you were on the court, I don't know whether we've ever talked about this. You know, federal courts can ask state courts to remain a question of state law. Yes. But it's discretionary with the state court as to whether or not they accept this case and do the work. And sometimes you do, and sometimes you feel as if the federal court is asking you to serve as their law clerks, and so you decline. <laughs> but we got a request, the only one I know of that what came did from, you get? we got from the United States Supreme Court mm -hmm. a request that we review, it was a, a procedural matter involving death penalty cases. And we said, well, you know, we can decline to accept jurisdiction, but we didn't, of course. You were good. <laughs> we took the case. Yeah, we did. So it, it is an interesting thing to know your, your decisions can be reviewed. Um, you write in the book also about firsts in the Supreme Court. And I think everybody would agree that you are the best known of the firsts at the court. Well, currently, there'll be others, and there were some. I mean, it was fun. We had the first African-American justice, and we had the first whatever. Yeah. What were the others? Well, you write about the first <laughs> the first female law clerk. I found that interesting. The first female law clerk was... During World War II for yes. Justice Douglas. Yes, and in World War II, all the men were getting drafted, and it was a little hard to get law clerks, and so... That was when the first woman law clerk was appointed. Isn't that amazing? He couldn't find any qualified men, right. so as a last resort, he turned to <laughs> As a last resort, he got a woman. And then, right, it, was, it wasn't until 1966 that another woman was hired as a law clerk. Right. So there was a long, dry spell there. Now it's about half and half, but it certainly took a long time. It always does, it seems. You, and of course, you just mentioned Justice Thurgood Marshall, who was the first African American on the court. You got to serve with him for quite a yes, long time. Yes, yes, and it was interesting to do. <coughs> when, when he got out of law school, he took a job to handle some cases involving discrimination against blacks. And he went all around the country hearing, helping on cases like that. And he had the most interesting matters to handle, and they were very challenging. And when we have our conferences to talk about the merits of the cases that had been argued at the court that week, and we'd sit around a table and talk about them, and the chief would start, and then down on order of seniority. And when it got to Thurgood Marshall, he'd say, well, this case reminds me of a story. I remember back when I went to Nashville and whatever it was, what year. What, and then he'd tell us what happened. And it was always so interesting. Everything reminded him of a story. He had a life. It was great. And you had a, a, a really close personal relationship, I think, with Justice well, Marshall. I really enjoyed listening to him and hearing those stories that he had to tell. More than most, yes. Um, there, we, there was a tradition at the Supreme Court where the law clerks for each chambers would go to lunch with most of the other justices. And I know everybody always looked forward to the Justice Marshall lunch because we yeah. knew we would be treated to some good stories. And didn't you get some when you we went did. to that lunch? <laughs> and he enjoyed telling them and we enjoyed hearing yeah. them. Well, you of course retired from the court a few years ago. Right. And didn't exactly go into doing nothing. Why don't you? Tell us something about what you've been doing since I'll retirement. I'll very brief, because it, I stepped down because my husband developed Alzheimer's. And I don't know how many of you have, as yet, had experience in your family with Alzheimer's. It's not pleasant, and there's no cure. There's nothing that can be prescribed that alleviates it. And so it's very a sad story, and eventually the person passes away, and so that was not a happy period of time. But um, that's why I decided that I'd better retire from the court. But then my husband did pass away, and I thought I still had a little bit of energy left, so I volunteered <laughs> to 
to sit with federal courts of appeal. And they don't have to invite me, but they know I'm available. And so I sit with a number of the federal courts of appeal around the country, and we hear the kinds of cases that end up having applications to the US Supreme Court. So it's a good source of case, cases of the type that I'm accustomed to hearing, and I like sitting with them. And it's also interesting to get better acquainted with some of the just judges whose opinions I would have reviewed from the Supreme Court level. So that's been good. I've enjoyed that. And then you have this little thing called iCivics. I started a program. Now, when I, I had to go to school, I was on the ranch over on the Lazy Bee, and there wasn't a school nearby. So my parents sent me off to El Paso, and I lived with my maternal grandparents there and went to school. And Every school I attended in El Paso had a civics class. It didn't matter whether you'd had it before or not. You were going to take civics. And I must say, I got a little tired of hearing about Sam Houston and all those Texans. I mean, that was, it was a little tiresome. Nonetheless, we had civics. And I did have the privilege of learning how our government is organized and how it's supposed to function and how we're part of it. Today, more than half of our states no longer teach civics or make it a requirement for even high school graduation. Now, I don't think we can have that. I think that's totally unacceptable because you don't just absorb it through the air you breathe. You have to learn how our government is organized. You have to understand what our Constitution is. You have to read it and see it and learn how our system works and learn how you're part of it. And I feel very strongly about that. So I got a little help and we <coughs> hired, well, we got as volunteers some very talented teachers of middle school and high school to tell us specific problems, areas that we needed to cover in teaching. And then we raised money and hired um, companies that make games to teach. And we had these companies make games to teach the concepts that the teacher said we should teach. And the result is this marvelous collection of, we now have, I think, 20 different games on iCivics. It's www.littleicivics.org. Now you go on there and look at it. The games are really fun to play. They're interesting. The young people love it. You have trouble getting them off. They like to just stay and play the games. And they're very successful in teaching people things. Our latest game is not that at all. We're teaching them how to write better. How about that? <laughs> and it was in the second one that deals with writing. So it's been very challenging and very exciting. We're now at the stage where there are about 30 million young people using the iCivics website every day. I want at least 70 million, so help me spread the word. That's your job, OK? And I, I really want everybody to be acquainted with this thing and get their children and grandchildren using it and their teachers too because it costs nothing for the school to use it and it's very very instructive so that's what i've been doing that's a great thing to do and as i recall a certain professor charles Cayeros might have been involved with the ice well program. he was and maybe he'll tell you something about it <laughs> Yeah, he's sitting right there. Okay, and I think we better stop so you can okay. see if there are any questions that we need to answer, Charles. And I do have some questions about the civics. Oh, good. And that was some very young people asking who made the games. It was a company in Wisconsin called Filament. Yes. They were really good at it, and they're, they're very fast. And uh, these uh, young questioners also were interested in your growing up on the ranch. Asking, what was the name of your horse? Chico was my first little horse. Chico means small in Spanish, if you don't know. And there was a wild horse herd that we was on the ranch, and we captured him and uh, 
tried to train some of them, and the smallest of the bunch was this low horse that we called Chico, and that became my horse. And he was fabulous. I think I never had a horse I liked more than Chico, so that was pretty much it. And a related question is, how did growing up on the Lazy Bee Ranch help prepare you for your professional and legal career? That's hard to say, but everyone on a ranch, I don't know how many of you have had that experience, but if you're on a ranch, everybody has to work. And everybody has a lot of responsibility. And you can't always have other people helping you. Sometimes you have to go do these things yourself. You have to go check the water supply at some distant place. You have to make the trip out there, maybe on your horse and see if it's functioning, and if it isn't, get it going again. And you have to do it by yourself. And so you learn, I think, a little personal responsibility if you live on a ranch. And that's not bad to learn. It's OK. It carries over to other things. And we have two related questions. So we remember that you were a state legislator. Yes. And one question to ask. Uh, your opinion of the importance of having legislative experience on the Supreme Court. And a related question, um, do you think the tone of political discourse has changed in the years since you uh, first sat on the Supreme Court? And I know it has not improved. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish it would. But um, you do learn something as a legislator. And People are not always in agreement, you know. And what I learned, particularly when I became majority leader of the state senate, was how I could improve the chances of having opposite views come together and do some problem solving among people with very different views. And that is a challenge, but it can be done. And the more we try to do that, and the more people we can put in office who understand how to do it, the better off we're going to be. Let me note that you often leave discussions at O'Connor House that advance civility. We, we try to, yes. How do you believe judicial merit selection has fared in Arizona? I want to ask former Chief Justice Ruth McGregor to talk about this. She's been deeply involved in that, and I want to hear her answer to this. Well, I'll keep this short so we can get back to questions to Justice O'Connor. But you know, we have merit selection in Arizona, partly because of Justice O'Connor and then Senator O'Connor, who really helped get this on the ballot. The people of Arizona adopted it. I think it's worked really well in Arizona. I mean, I've been a lawyer since 1974, and I spent 20 years on the bench working with judges, our trial court judges, court of appeals, and Supreme Court judges, justices. And we're really fortunate in yeah. the overall quality of our judges and in the non-political sense. I see Chief Justice Rebecca Birch up there, who oh, was one of, our, one of the products of our merit selection system and oh, has yes. just done wonderful work on the court. And we can go across the state and see that. You also can look at the difference between courts that have in states where there is merit selection and where there is not. And there's a noticeable difference in the attitude toward the courts because people feel their judges are more fair if they don't have to come to the bench through a really political process. So I think it served us very well. And the ratings the judges in Arizona get show that the public and the lawyers agree that we produced a very good bench. When I first became a judge in Arizona, it was a very long time ago, we didn't have merit selection. And I, it was for a trial court position, and I had to run for the <coughs> office as a candidate. There was opposition. I had to raise a little money and you know get some signs and put out a mailer or something. I forget now. <laughs> now, who were the people who contributed money to my campaign? They were the very lawyers who were most apt to need to come before me. <laughs> they were the ones who contributed. Now, is that the way you want your judges selected? No. I mean, that's just not, it doesn't make sense. And no other nation in the world selects their judges that way. Nobody else. And so I think it's strange that we still do so much of that in the US. Luckily, we changed that in Arizona, and we don't do that now, at least 
not in this county, not in the big counties, and uh, we're much better off for it. Okay, last question or two. Well, here's an interesting one about uh, some inside information about the court that's in your book. So in the book, it mentions law clerk parodies of the court. Uh, what? So law clerk parodies? Do they have skits? Oh, yes, 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 oh, yes, yes. Like yes. Jurassic Park, where there are yes. that were notable. Yes. Well, <laughs> at the U.S. Supreme Court, at the end of the term of the court, um, Typically, the law clerks like to get together, and Ruth McGregor can talk about this too, and see if they can put together a, an amusing show for everybody to come. And they'll put on some kind of skit having to do with how the court operates. What did you do the year you well, were there? Well, actually, when I was there, it hadn't started yet. So okay. we just had a chamber skit. It was just okay. the four of us. And you and John O'Connor were mostly our audience. Yeah. <laughs> But it was very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was. But you can imagine the fun that they have at the court when some of the clerks get together and put on a little skit and make fun of what's going on that year. It's all right. It's good. And was that the last question that I hear, or do you, should we do a few more? We have time for two more. <laughs> all right, good. This one is addressed to both the justices. Was there a particular case that was the most memorable for you? Well, I don't think I'll ever forget Bush Gore, but don't <laughs> ask me. How about you? What did you Well, I think the, the one I remember best from the year I was a clerk was uh, Hogan versus Mississippi University for Women. Oh, yes. Because it was a, it was yeah, a gender was discrimination great. case, and it involved this, in some ways, kind of, I mean, so typically, Southern public universities set up for women so they could learn to crochet and do needlepoint and <laughs> set tables. I don't know, but that was the original charter, so, so I remember that better than the more complicated parts of it. Well, the last question is one that was repeated many times. I saw many of the cards stating that you had an inspiration, particularly to young women and wondering if you had any advice to young women entering the profession or men and women entering the profession at this time? Well, it goes back to my old ranch upbringing, I guess. If you are given a job, try to do it well. Work hard and try to do it well. Give it your best. Don't be a slacker. <laughs> Even if it isn't something you particularly enjoy, you're going to learn something in the process that will serve you better later. So that's my advice. Well, thank you very much for this very enlightening. Okay.